I never see that particular song that I don't think about some of the places I've been in the world that made me question myself uh, as to not being afraid. I can safely go because of my faith in Jesus Christ, although I would attribute that faith in Christ to be the thing that has sustained, as it has every Christian, all of us through whatever there has been going on in our lives. We take for granted so many things here in this nation as to the protection of law and things of that nature that so many places in the world just do not have. But I never think of that song, but that I think of some of the times I've wondered if few places I've been, just how things are going to turn out. But they always came out all right. I remember Brother Rice saying one time that as they were in Cambodia and he was in a little truck and the country was in considerable upheaval at that time and there was a soldier at a roadblock and he was demanding money and they flew on through the roadblock and they heard that AK-47 open up and they could hear it hitting the hitting the truck and he said after they got around the curve he said I started feeling myself see if there was any blood running <laughs> so there are certain things that are, are are more immediate and more fearful than certain other things old songs are good songs not because they're old but because of the reason people sing those songs over and over again and we should develop a faith in Christ that allows us to not have the fear that people who have no hope have and who do not think about having God for their protector. Now, you probably thought that was going to be an introduction to my lesson. No, that was just a freebie just handed out. It has nothing to do with my lesson. My lesson tonight is going to deal, or this afternoon, with the sin of presumption. Am I a presumptuous person? Have I committed the sin of presumption? Have you presumed anything? Well, I might start first of all with what is the meaning of presumption? Again, consult any good dictionary and you'll see it'll say something like too bold, forward, taking too much for granted. Showing overconfidence, arrogance, effrontery. And there are some other words that help clarify the meaning of this particular sin. Foolish or rash boldness, effrontery, which implies insolence in defying the rules of propriety. I really think nowadays my insight to what's going on. I don't know that some people even know there are rules of propriety or there ever was any. Presumption, mocking, and pride are all involved as you study your Bible in blasphemy, which is to speak against God and holy things. So blasphemy is profane or contemptuous speech. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, in verse 3, speak no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. I think we ought to say at this point that to speak because you know something, and to speak as you do know something, some people would call being arrogant. I remember well Brother Warren years ago saying that if you claim to absolutely know anything, some people tried to say you were arrogant simply because you claimed that something is a matter of knowledge. You make a knowledge claim. Well, you can be arrogant in the way you go about doing it, but just to say, I know something to be the case and then prove that you do is not within itself necessarily a matter of pride or arrogancy. The proud and presumptuous 
Pharaoh of the Old Testament rejected the one true and living God and his message through Moses and Aaron. Listen to how it reads in Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Again, Exodus 5, 1 through 2. To me, as I read that and think of that ancient age, which Pharaoh himself considered himself a god, and his perspective of what it was to be a god, no knowledge whatsoever of the one true and living God of Israel. That this sounds more like a lot of people today as they remove themselves more from the knowledge of the God of the Bible. And they question everything about the rules, if you want to call them that, or the righteousness that is presented in the words of the Bible. But such has been the way of evil men since time has begun. In Matthew 27, 41 through 43, likewise the chief priest mocking him concerning Jesus with the scribes and elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now, if he will have him. For he said, I am the son of God. Now, mind you, Jesus spent a little over three years every day in that little small country working miracles to confirm that what he said came from God and not from man, that he was who he claimed to be. That's obvious from John 3 in the discussion that he had with Nicodemus one night when Nicodemus admitted that we know, there's a knowledge claim, isn't it? We know that thou art a teacher come from God. For no man can do these miracles except God be with him. He got it right. He didn't understand all about the Messiah, but neither did any of the Jews, even his disciples, for they had a corrupted concept of the Messiah, and his kingdom, and the place of the Jews, the law of Moses. They just didn't understand. They had to be taught out of that. But the point I'm making is, is that if Nicodemus could realize that the miracles said this man has God with him, so could anyone else who was honest. Thus, when you look at Luke chapter 8 and verse 15, the soil or the mind in which that one seed, the seed of the kingdom, the word of God, Luke 8, 11, was sown, that found a resting place and it germinated and it brought forth fruit was the good and honest heart. The inward man, the mind, was honest. It was willing to take truth simply because it was the truth. But there were people then, as Pharaoh and as these scribes and elders and chief priests, would not do so. Remember, they even admitted that he worked miracles, but they didn't want to attribute it to God. That's very dishonest on their part. Because Jesus used that particular situation to say, well, if Satan is divided against Satan, then his kingdom can't stand. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Which was to say, your conclusions about the one who gives me the power to work these miracles is totally false. The miracles, therefore, commented on the fact that God was with him, that these miracles were done by him, and thus he is the Son of God. Yet they derided him on the cross. He said he's the Son of God. They mocked him. There's something that comes from this, and that is it shows if we do not guard our own minds, if we're not so very careful to be honest with the truth, we can get to right where these scribes and priests were. 
Folks, they were very religious people. Paul even said on Mars Hill of the Gentiles who were caught up in false pagan religions, he says after he saw the altar to the unknown God, I perceive that, as the King James says, you're too superstitious, which meant you're really trying to make sure in your idea of the panoply of, uh, of gods that make up your protection that you don't miss one. Because of their concept of God, they thought they might, so they had the altar of the unknown God. And Paul says, I'm going to declare him to you. I'm going to preach the one, the true, and the living God. Yet man left to his own devices, and man who is dishonest can go to the point, ah, to actually killing the Son of God. And John 20, 30 and 31 says plainly, and many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing have life through his name. So it's obvious then that John says the Holy Spirit guided me as an apostle of Christ to record all of these uh, proofs throughout the book of John because they prove that Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So we need to be sure that we are not coming to conclusions about things and making charges wherein there is no evidence, wherein there is no proof. My emotions may make me want to do this, that, or the other, or not what ought to be done. But the proof may, says no, may say, no, this, this needs to be done. This has to be done. I'll show you how that works rather quickly. You go to the doctor because you've been feeling pretty puny for, for several weeks, or maybe even months. You just don't get any better. They do a battery of tests, as they want to do, and they say, Now, Mr. Brown, we've got some news for you. You've got cancer. Well, all you feel right now is that you're just tired. Now, you don't think that won't be something to... Um, make you come to grips with a few things? Well, certainly it will. It can change your whole perspective of everything that's going on from that point forward. But now if they make that declaration having not the proof, you may say, how do you know? I think I'll get a second opinion, maybe a third opinion. And you may that do that anyway because something that serious you want to do all that's within your powers to know something done to make sure. Why? Notice I say make sure. You're trying to come to certain knowledge. That's what you want. And how much more so is that true of spiritual things? You know, we, we fight to stay hold of this body and this life and Stay here just as long as we can. And God expects us to appreciate the sanctity of life in the flesh. And we may be here a long time. But have you noticed back over there in the Old Testament when it says so and so lived a hundred and so many years and beget somebody and then after he beget somebody he lived 500 more years begetting sons and daughters but then you ever notice how it ends up? And he died Every time it says he died, God made it clear because you sinned and opened the door for sin to come into the world, then death passes upon all men. So fight all you want to fight, do all you can, and that's all well and good, but you're going to die. This Lord comes back first. The wonder of it all is when you go with Jesus to the house of Lazarus, only when he gets there, Lazarus is in the tomb, that is, his body is. And here the Lord says, all this happened so that I could teach a lesson. You remember, Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And he makes it clear that he'll be raised. Oh, I know, she says, that he'll rise in the general resurrection is what she was meaning. But he says something then. That ought to be a joy to everybody. I am the resurrection and the life. 
And so he simply cries out, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus came forth. Someday, he's going to speak and everybody will rise from the grave. Now the point I'm making is, is that we have that evidence once we prove the Bible to be the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, the final and complete revelation of God to man. We have in the Bible that he is going to raise the dead and he's going to raise the righteous dead. So whatever happens to you is the point. No matter whether you live a brief life in the flesh or a long one in the flesh, or whatever happens to you in between birth and death, however long it may be, there is the resurrection. You will be raised again. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He deals with that. He gives that kind of assurance. As John says, we do not know what we shall be like, but we shall be like him. So there's going to be life for the faithful child of God. So we don't want to be presumptuous, but we do want proof to come to the proper conclusion, having thought it through correctly, and then stand upon whatever that truth is. As we're commanded, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. We also know that people who live uh, an arrogant attitude of saying, I'm better than you, and looking down their noses at us, or maybe somebody at somebody else. Isaiah said, living 700 years before Christ, the great Messianic prophet, in chapter 13 and 11, I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. Now, I know that God will take care of everything. I think that is one of the most uh, comforting thoughts there is. That if I am faithful to him, then I'm blessed. You notice in the song we sang, sang a moment ago, he leads me over the dreariest ways. Well, he may. Do you ever think that suffering in your life may be for your own good? You might never form a character that you really need to form and that you pray all the time that you'll have unless you go through certain things that makes you exercise some of the things you wouldn't exercise if it wasn't for whatever ailments come upon you. Just go to the end of Job, and he's a far better man all the way around, even material gain at the end of the Job than he was when he started. Yet when he, when he started, God said of Job to Satan, he's one that hates evil. He loves the good. There's no man like him on the earth. And yet he's a greater man at the end of Job than he was when he started out. Matthew 15, 18, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's why we're taught to guard our hearts with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. It's wrong to question God's reason for our being. I still like to remember that this life is perfect for what God made it to be. And what did he make us to be in this life and this whole realm of things? A place to get ready for heaven. We try to get ready for here and now. God says, no, this life is to get ready for heaven. It is complete the way that it is. All these things come and go and we undergo this, that, and the other. But we hold to God's unchanging word and we get through it. And it makes us better and it molds our character. It's wrong to question God's reason for our being. God created every one of us according to his will and according to his purpose. It is God who is the potter, and we are the clay. Again, back to Job. He was confronted with this truth when God answered Job's questions with, with a question. Remember, Job said, oh, if he was just here before me, I would ask him thus and so. Well, he got his opportunity, and here's what happened. Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? 
He that reproveth God, let him answer. Job 40 and verse 2. And he then says something like, Where were you when I formed all this creation? We need to realize how really little we are. There's no room for arrogancy. There must be room for proof that gives us the wherewithal to stand solid. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid up for you in his excellent word. And that's what we need. Bildad the Shuite had previously told Job how insignificant man is in comparison to God, when he said, Behold even to the moon, and it shineth not. Yea, the stars are not pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man which is a worm. Job 25, 5 and 6. But how great is man in God's sight? How am I to form a view of myself that is correct? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then when he talks about the business of what shall a man give in exchange for so. He's trying to help us to see that that eternal part of you is greater than this whole world. Now, when people turn around and say, you're nothing but the product of slime that came out of a premortal puddle, when they try to do that, and you think about that long enough, what does that mean that you really are as you think about the implications of that? Nothing. And people begin to treat one another the same way. If you're nothing but a hairless improved ape, and I really believe that and you believe that, then why should we treat one another as hairless improved ape? You will because we think in our hearts and what we think in our hearts, that's what we are. Isaiah gives us further warning. Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherd strive with the potsherds of the earth. Those are broken pieces of pots. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work, he hath no hands. Isaiah 45, 9. We are God's creation. He holds sway over us. He's the creator. He sets the standard. He can do with his creation as he pleases, and he pleases as his nature, which comes from the essence of his being, has him act. And the Bible says God is love. And he says man's made a little lower than the angels. And how much is man worth? He sent his only begotten son to make a way for him to escape eternal damnation. It's a serious matter when truth is twisted to suit our will so error is taught instead of God's word. Where do we think all error, false doctrine, where does it come from? Well, it doesn't come from God. It has to come from our arch enemy, Satan himself. In Isaiah 5, 20, again, remember, he's the messianic prophecy. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That's going on right now, folks. You listen to people telling us it is a good thing in matters of morality to kill unborn babies, murder them in the womb. And the man shouldn't feel bad about that. There should be no compunction of conscience when you read that thousands upon thousands of them have been killed because the place where they should be most protected and have the greatest security has become their tomb. He says to put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Isaiah 5 and verse 20. We who are anchored in the truth of God's word and weigh all things in the light of it and who seek the truth of God's will, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. We know the difference between what's bitter and what's not. What's sweet and what's bitter. 
Nehemiah 9, 16, But they and our fathers dealt proudly and hardened their necks and hearkened not to thy commandments. That sounds pretty much like situations today, especially this country in matters of morality. And as far as people striving to be simply New Testament Christians, it covers religious people. In Jeremiah 7, 28, but thou shalt say unto them, This is a nation that obeyeth not the voice of the Lord their God, nor receiveth correction. Truth is perished and is cut off from their mouth. Fresh as the news right off of the internet. And it's true. Presumptuous sin started, of course, in the Garden of Eden when Satan refuted what God had instructed Adam and Eve to do by saying, Ye shall not surely die, Genesis 3, 1 through 5. Consider the father of the faithful, as great as he was. Abraham was presumptuous when he questioned God's angel concerning Sodom, Genesis 18, 23 through 32. That discussion there was for Abraham's benefit. God knew what he was doing. God knew the outcome of that discussion before it ever started. You watch many of the discussions between God and the Old Testament worthies. God is omniscient. He knows all that is the object of knowledge. But Abraham questions if there's 50, if there's 40, if there's 30. Don't you think God already knew? What was not there, that that's the reason he had already concluded to send the angels to destroy them because there was not anything to keep it going. There was no hope. And then there's priests of all people, Nadab and Nabihu, who were presumptuous because they offered what's called strange fire before the Lord, Leviticus 10, 1 and 2. Strange in what sense? Strange to the authority of what they were to use as taught in the law of Moses. And that's what we don't want to be guilty of. King Saul was presumptuous when he, being not a priest, made sacrifice unto the Lord, 1 Samuel 13, 8 through 14. He had no authority from God to do that. Saul was also disobedient and presumptuous when he spared the Amalekites who the Lord instructed him to utterly destroy, 1 Samuel 15, 3, and verses 9 through 23. As good as we think James and John, brothers, apostles, were, they were presumptuous when they desired Jesus to call down fire on the Samaritans, Luke 9, 54. I think that kind of makes us identify with them sometimes when you try so hard to do what's right with people and you get it cast back in your teeth. Well, there's a little encouragement there because look what they became through further and proper knowledge of the truth and living it, but look where they were at that time. And they were called Bonangeri, sons of thunder. Then there's Diotrephes being very presumptuous by loving to have the preeminence among the people, even to the point of rejecting folks sent by the Apostle John, the Apostle of Love, 3 uh, third John 9. We do not want to find ourselves presumptuous. We want to act upon adequate evidence and credible witnesses. We want to prove all things and act only on that which is proven. Remember these admonitions. Let another man praise thee, and not thine own mouth. A stranger, and not thine own lips. Proverbs 27, 2. We think of the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom. And it is. In Luke 14, 11, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Then Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. People will read that and they'll miss the whole point. Because the first time that somebody like this stands up for the truth, they won't compromise, they'll try to say he transgressed this passage. Folks, the best thing you can do for me in helping me go to heaven is to make sure that I'm doing what the Bible says. The best thing you can do for yourself, same thing for me, is to make sure I'm doing what God told me to do. 
That's the reason that in preaching, Paul said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Then he tells us, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be turned away from the truth and the fables. 2,000 years ago that was written. How many times has it happened? We read, though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. Psalm 13, verses, oh, Psalm 138, verse 6. Psalm 138, verse 6. The sin of presumptuousness. Are we guilty of it? We need to be cautious. We need to be careful. We need to recognize that a great many people who toot their own horns are no more than the blare of the horn. Remember Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 that if I don't have love, I'm but a tinkling cymbal. If you think about it literally, it's like kicking a can down the street. That's just about all that works. It just makes a racket. So we need the love that leads us, first of all, to love God with all that we have and are, to love our neighbor as ourself, to love the brethren, and that will lead us to love the truth, and we'll live the truth, and we'll teach the brethren the truth, and we'll help each other come to the knowledge of the truth. For without that proper knowledge... We have no anchor to hold us and no guidance. And thus we'll fall victim to there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death, and we'll be presumptuous in so many areas. If you're not a child of God this afternoon, we beg of you to believe in Christ with all your heart. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you've been guilty of the sin of presumption, or other sins, then we urge you to humbly approach God in repentance and prayer, having confessed those sins. And it's always good to close every Bible lesson that we, cl that we close, or saying simply that God wants us to be saved. That's how he loves us. He's made it all possible. What stands between us and being saved is usually our old stubborn will. But if you're subject to the invitation of Christ, we bid you come while we stand and while we sing.